Okay. All right. We are going to get started here. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, so because we have some remote participants, I am going to ask that we do uh, some introductions. Um, I, Councillor Brown, would you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Carrie Brown. I'm a council member from District 3. Great, thank you. And Councillor Morton, go ahead. Hi, I am uh, Jennifer Morton, District 3. Super, thank you. <clears throat> okay, and I think we are otherwise good to go. Uh, so just some logistics. Uh, so if you are joining us remotely, if you would change your name to your first and last name so I can address you uh, properly, we have that for the record. Uh, and then when you uh, speak, if you would start by saying your name and where you live, and we are asking folks to keep their comments to uh, two minutes or less, uh, and we'll uh, help you out with that. Uh, if you are uh, speaking on any particular item um, as we go through the agenda, make sure that your comments are germane to the topic. Um, and if you wish to speak, make sure that you are uh, just recognized by me before you do. And um, uh, if you have multiple questions, if you would ask all of your questions um, sort of together uh, consecutively, that would be helpful because we don't really do like a back and forth in this setting. Um, Yeah, I think that is it. Um, okay, so uh, the next thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, I think that as for um, what is currently on the agenda, I don't think there's any adjustments that need to be made uh, unless anybody has any different information. Does anyone have um, any suggestions? Is that Cassie? Connor, did you want to? Yeah, I, th I think that might be good to add an item about, uh, I, guess, I guess it would be vacancy planning. So. Okay. Yep. Um, so we'll add that to the end uh, of the agenda. Uh, actually, to be fair, let's add it to just before the executive session. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Um, anything else? I think that is it. Uh, okay. So on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on uh, any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. If you have something that is relevant to one of these agenda items that will come up and you'll be welcome to address it as we go. Uh, but if it's not on the uh, on our agenda, otherwise now is a, a good time to uh, bring it up. So uh, yeah, it, we'll start with folks who are with us in person. Anyone in person wish to address the council? Go ahead. Here's the order of objection two minute constraint because there's a lot to cover here. Uh, we can't seem to clear the leaves from the storm drain, so we've got water backed up in the crosswalks, but we can yank the last, we can find time to yank the last available bench for people to sit on on the nice days. Uh, it's just a a symptom of a dysfunction. Um, we can take dirt and shelter away. We can kick the can down the road on restrooms for year after year, the publicly owned restrooms. Now we've locked in last week, somebody locked the information booth as if those pamphlets really need protection. Whereas people have been sleeping in there who are unhoused and it just, it reeks of, uh, mm -hmm. It's not just incompetence, it's not just drag and anchor, it's cruelty to the point of sadistic. We've got people sleeping outside, we know it, we do nothing about it, we commission studies for day shelters. Try sleeping outside yourself, just really get, get, get a little conscious. Uh, closed captions still aren't available, I'm objecting to that once again. Uh, school street closure, the sign went out but on the weekend, Friday or Saturday, uh, several calls were made warning them that the sign was out. Um, everybody cleared the street last night and then no construction started this morning and people started parking there again. Uh, I diligently followed the alternate side parking rules and I was on the 
odd number, even numbered side on the even numbered day, it's still got a warning ticket. Um, it's dysfunctional. You read the website about alternate parking and it's like from here to the end, it's like, which end? It, it's really, it's, it's dysfunctional uh, communications. Maybe you can put your new communications expert on. One Second, minute, at the last policy committee meeting, Zach and I joined to discuss potential revisions to our D. Does that come out of my two minutes? No, you no, did. Sure, yeah. uh, um, just so you know, you are just at about um, two minutes now, but go ahead a little bit. And well, I think your, your autocracy here with, you know, it's like Putin and I'm the, your Navalny, and I'm sure glad you don't have access to Novichok or my underwear for that matter. Um, why autocracies fail? They, they, they in practice, they don't hire the smartest or best people. People might be threatening. They, they hire the dimmest and the most mediocre. You get a government of third raters. Autocratic leaders in practice are serving their own regime and longevity, even if it means neglecting their people. Thank you. Anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Okay, we will then go to uh, folks with us digitally. Uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, I spoke with Brenda Siegel yesterday. She asked me to please bring to the attention of the city council and others, particularly since we have two city councilors who are going to be in the legislature. The announcement um, by the Department of um, Children and Families, which was picked up by WCAX and also an article by the uh, Vermont Digger, is rather misleading. The, this is not an, an expansion. This is a, going back to pre-COVID um, rules that, um, and in fact, making some of them even more difficult for people to qualify to be in motel rooms um, and uh, by actually penalizing them, for example, there were almost no hotel rooms, motel rooms available in Washington County. But let's say there's one in Addison County, but the person who needs the room really can't get away, doesn't want to leave Washington County. They, they have, their doctors are here, their children are here or whatever. If they don't take the Addison County offering, they can't qualify for any, for a very long period of time. Like, I think it's a year. Brenda has the details, but it's a horrible uh, decision. And it's been missed uh, because of this, the, 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 because of the uh, DCF um, press release, it's been misreported in, in, uh, in the media. Digger got it a little clearer than WCAX, but it, I know this is a state issue, but it has tremendous impact on our area because we simply, in our area, we do not have the rooms in the motels. And so I want you guys to be aware of it and I hope you will look into it. I brought it up to the homelessness task force, which I'm now on uh, today. One minute, Peter. Okay. Uh, but it's something that's got to be attended to. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, uh, Peter. We appreciate that. Um, anyone else with us virtually wish to make a comment? Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Um, move to approve. Second. Is there any uh, further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes unanimously, so we don't need to do a roll call. And so we're gonna move on to uh, appointments to uh, the Planning Commission. And so we have an applicant, uh, Brian Mills. Check, check, check. One, two, yeah, okay. I don't know if it's been five minutes, but we're here. We're ready to go? Okay, cool. All right, so we're gonna uh, bring it back together then. Thank you.
um, for that. Uh, right, Brian Mills, you're here with us. Uh, if you would mind uh, coming up to introducing yourself and telling us about your interest in serving on the Planning Commission. Hi, good evening. Uh, I'm Brian Mills. I, uh, relatively new, relatively new resident of Montpelier. Um, uh, my family and I love living here. Uh, I'm a consultant. I, my work centers around land use permitting and zoning, helping projects get approved. So it seemed like a good fit. And, uh, I look forward to digging in and helping with the city plan. Super. Thank you. Um, any questions for, uh, for Brian? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, is there a motion? Uh, yes, Jack. I move that we appoint Brian Mills to the Planning Commission. Second. Hey, okay, there's a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Right, so that is unanimous motion carries. So we do not need to uh, do a no roll chance. call. <laughs> Thank you. No curing balance. <laughs> Thank you for your willingness to step up and serve. We appreciate it. <laughs> okay, all right. So uh, uh, legislative agenda. Um, so, which is a little bit funny because Connor and I are going to be. Uh, moving that direction so it's almost like we're like, what are we gonna say we've, what are we gonna be asking of ourselves we've got 40 percent um, of our <laughs> delegation here here already uh a lot of conversations with myself this <laughs> well I, and you're on the yes. adv advocacy committee right so um do you it's it's you and lauren and jack right so i may and there's nothing you want to do you want to weigh in on this at, at all because otherwise i'm going to try yeah, to be with them you. so when we set this up i i mean i can weigh in actually to start okay sure go for it um so you know as you know we've had an active legislative agenda we have our advocacy group here i asked them to join us tonight just so they could hear the conversation and get a sense of what was important to us uh, we took last year's agenda went through it took off things that either were weren't as relevant or had been accomplished you know, and uh, added a couple of things that have come up um, in conversation this year and drafted that to put out for your conversation. But obviously, the council is free to add, subtract, multiply, and divide uh, as you see fit. So with that, I'll let the, the committee members weigh in. Yeah, I, I mean, probably not a surprise. It's Similar enough to what we had last year, there were a few additions, a few subtractions, but like big issues, we're, we're still dealing with the idea that, you know, state employees are not coming back to Montpelier to the level we may have anticipated or hoped. Um, I, I think that leaves a lot of tumbleweeds rolling downtown, affecting our economic development, affecting our park and affecting everything. Uh, so you'll see that's listed as the highest priority there. One thing I think we got to look at is if they're not coming back, we have a lot of empty lots in town, right? Um, lots that could be used for housing for a number of different projects here, riverfront access. If you look at like what Sustainable Montpelier did with the maps of the red, you know, that uh, about the river there, it, it's pretty stark. So, you know, if state employees don't come back, we got to use those lots. So uh, definite priority uh, as we recover from COVID. Uh, you know, the recommendations of the Homelessness Task Force, I, I think we've done our best at the city level to uh, try to have some social services with the liaison position, vouchers, uh, trying to help out the best we can with sheltering. Uh, but it is limited. And, you know, as, as Peter Cummin just said, this is a, you know, it's a regional problem as well. So we really need to shake some trees at the state level to see if we can get some funding um, to, to do right by folks in our community here. Uh, so hopefully we can do that. Um, I, I could blab on on all these, but, you know, PFAS, certainly Lauren's on top of that, um, still being an issue that we're following very closely. And, uh, yeah, and still trying to tap into some of these, uh, some of the the, the uh, federal money uh, that we're getting. And I, I think we have a great team with Leonine cracking that. Keep in mind, we didn't bring Leonine on board until, like, I think a few weeks into the legislative session last time. And uh, I thought they did a, a fantastic job as far as 
communicating with us regularly and just keeping a thumb on the pulse of the building. So I don't know if uh, other committee members want to weigh in. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think that's a good overview. Um, you know, people can see a lot more detail in here. I mean, it. I'm wondering if it might be helpful just to hear since um, our lobbyists came just like any reflections on the role that you play just as we get to a tough budget season and like are figuring out what we can fund for next year just to, I don't know like explain a little bit how that worked for us um, having you all advocating for us in the building I don't know if that feels okay Anne <laughs> oh yeah that's great yeah that would be wonderful either one either one whatever you're most comfortable with They do. Uh, I think, I think they do not. Does not. <laughs> <laughs> not the kind of feedback you came for, right? <laughs> so I'm Maggie Lenz. I'm the vice president of strategic communications at Leonine Public Affairs and work for the government relations team. And I'm Nick Sherman, president of government relations at Leonine Public Affairs. Yeah. So I want to be clear. I didn't come in here prepared to you know talk strategy, um, but I do want to talk about last session um, versus this session. I think Connor pointed out was key. We did come in, you know, the second year of the biennium, it was a little late. So it was more, um, from my perspective, identifying opportunities that we could find easily and then trying to um, work through those. So I think we were successful working with Senator Cummings um, on the TIF district, TIF district um, language. We also um, had, you know, some last minute fixes to work on getting money for dispatch here in central Vermont. More to come. Um, and more to come, exactly, yeah. So I think we're, I'm really happy that we've engaged with you earlier this time around. I think it gives us time to actually go through these opportunities and create our own as opposed to just trying to, at the last minute, find ones that um, are easier to access. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're gonna be having, you know, a closer meeting with, I'm sure the mm -hmm. lobbying team and with Bill to talk about these priorities and actually create strategy um cool the fact that you have you know your mayor <laughs> is going to be hitting the legislator soon um connor casey kate mccann i think it's just montpelier is in a great position oh, and lauren's going to be in the building yeah <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of legislators i think you're going to be really well positioned to um to meet a bunch of your goals this session yeah anything you want to say yeah i think and then in terms of budget and the state budget and looking toward the 2023 session, I think there are going to be some dynamics sort of globally that are similar to the last couple of years with a, a large amount of federal money being on the table in the one time sense. Um, but also, you know, the, the forecasts now are looking for, uh, in terms of the base budget, a pretty level year in the fiscal year to come but beyond that um there's some shortfalls projected and the dynamic even in even last year when things were a little rosier has been that uh leadership in the house and the senate have been uh, eager to find ways to uh maximize the impact of that federal money that has come in and i think we think that will continue so as you think about opportunities and we discuss opportunities for Montpelier to leverage that, um, you know, that one time, but those one time buckets are are really important. Um, I think we are going to see, as has been the trend, um, base spending being harder and being more uh, more concerned about what that will mean for the out years when uh, revenues may not be looking so good. Mm -hmm. So. That's kind of the dynamic at this point as we see it. Yeah, and I think, you know, you're talking about homelessness. There's multiple issues that are not just Montpelier issues. They are, they're regional issues. And so that means that, issues. right, exactly. They're statewide issues. And that's going to mean that we've also helped by finding collaborators and other stakeholders and other towns and cities who need similar things and work with them when possible. Toward that end, I think um, to, to your point, Nick and Maggie, about the, the one-time money, one of our biggest concerns or opportunities, I guess, is, you know, there is a huge amount of money, infrastructure money, and, uh, inflation reduction mm -hmm. money, all that, those kind of things. But because Vermont's so small, it's all going to the state. 
And so it's hot, you know, and I would assume it's teaming up with other communities and the League of Cities and Towns, but making sure those funds go into programs for municipal governments. I mean, it's still up on us to then apply for them and compete for them, but yeah. if they don't even get to the table to go to local governments, uh, which I think a lot of them are intended to, um, you know, we've seen that in the past where these funds come in and the state kind of gobbles them up for their own uses. And so transportation money all goes into Route 89 and never makes it to, to you know, municipalities. And uh, even, you know, even the dispatch money that we fought so hard for, they just reallocated some of that to state dispatch centers, um, even though this was for local dispatch money. So, you know, I think it's making sure that these things stay where they're supposed to be going. Yeah. I just want to call out for not just your benefit, but everyone's benefit, some of the, the things that were new, the, the old ones, I don't think matter, but just, so we specifically said, you know, use the infrastructure bill money to provide funds to local government. It's mm -hmm. obvious, but we call that out. Yeah. We added the strengthened laws against human trafficking. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty robust conversation in here for several meetings about that issue uh, and wanted to be sure we were on record as, as saying that. Um, I mean, it says provide funding for phase two of regional public safety dispatching equipment, but that was before we found out that phase one had been delayed. So I think that's gonna be a fight. Um, and I think the other one, we mentioned TIF. We specifically added the words project-based TIF, and we can talk about that. I think the league is gonna push for that um, as well, but I think that's something that could actually benefit us even more than what we fought for last year. And otherwise, I think, I don't think I, did I miss anything new? Well, I don't know what new, but I do think people should know that uh, we have uh, one of our very highest priorities is state funding for housing. You know, right. housing for years has been one of the highest priorities in the council, and we certainly know that it's a serious uh, need in, in Montpelier, and we have some opportunities. So, get getting money from the state government to address that is going to be helpful. The things that, about public safety, very important. Mm -hmm. um, I think the message we sent um, with the uh, big ordinance debate uh, earlier in the year was that it was not the end of the discussion, it was the beginning of the discussion, and that's why the human trafficking is such a big uh, big deal. Um, I, think, I think this looks good. Just note that we're uh, apropos of the, the comments we heard earlier, we are wanting to take another run at public restroom yeah, funding. Uh, we did not get a warm reception, at least from the administration level last year. But but the legislature, I think they they were already more open to it. It was just, again, a timing issue. Right. So and I'll try to work on that, too, with the administration. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, actually, before we go to you, Lauren, was there anything else? I, I want to make sure that we didn't interrupt your train of thought. I mean, I think I've said everything that okay. I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Yes. You well. it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead, Lauren. Yeah. I mean, this is just still on the line of the federal money getting to communities. And I think there's going to be, um, for example, uh, like the municipal energy resilience initiative where there was an issue around ARPA eligibility. I believe they found, um, building EGS, whatever that's, <laughs> building grounds and services administration money, but um, kind of underscoring the importance of some of those programs that are gonna fund important initiatives um, in communities like Montpelier um, that they, if they need to like move money around because of eligibility issues with the federal strings, um, that they're still, you know, emphasizing the importance of programs like that and um, looking, you know, and if we can be helpful, it's like the kinds of important work that can be done with that funding. Um, so I think, there could be a number of programs like that, that as they learn more about federal eligibility, there might be some ongoing lobbying to make sure they can continue to try to fund those programs. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. You know, transportation's a big point to hit too, especially as we look at the use for the, uh, the former Elks Club property. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, it is some distance from town. And right now I, I think um, GMT is struggling uh, recruiting drivers. Uh, to the point where our own micro transit is, you know, the, the delay times are longer than we would hope for at this point. Uh, but we don't want that to be a chilling effect for people who don't have public transportation to get up to that property to use it for recreational opportunities or anything else there. So uh, beefing up the funding on that would be huge. Yeah. Yeah. I 
I think, I guess one, one more thing I would add just generally regarding the funding and it sort of relates to what, what everyone said here is, I think from an advocacy standpoint, the ability for the city to show that you can get the money to work quickly is gonna be very compelling. I think as we get three years into these influxes of various levels of federal funding coming in, and, and particularly when thinking about eligibility challenges and concern, because often it's just as you know, the unknown that kind of prevents them from wanting to do something. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, incentive and sort of, uh, yeah, I, I think the legislature and the administration are going to want to be looking for ways that this money can get to work quickly, because frankly, I think that's been a bit of a challenge so mm -hmm. far. So as we sort of think about the advocacy, thinking about that mm -hmm. is important. And I, yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that. And, and I mean, I think you're mm -hmm. right. Uh, and I think that's an opportunity for some dialogue with local governments and with people involved in these things because um, maybe the state should take a look at what it takes to be able to do these projects quickly. You know, I think there's this emphasis to do it. And then when you can't get approvals turned around for engineering designs and those kinds of things and the permits that you need to go forward, uh, even at a local level, you know, where we, we were almost a year waiting for a design approval on our East State Street. We had to delay that whole project this year because we just waiting on a state approval. And I think it's staffing. I don't think it's the, but so I think there needs to be some sense that number one, uh, there's a lot of investment in design and prep that people may not be willing to make unless they're certain they're going to get the funding. Yeah. You know, you get to lay out a couple hundred thousand dollars to hopefully get this grant. Um, so, so I, I just urge that there be some understanding that not everyone's going to be getting money and say, okay, I'm going to dig up the ground and put in water lines or, you know, internet or whatever, build a homeless housing uh, tomorrow now that I've got it. Right. Uh, because we all then have to do what it takes to complete those projects, including public processes and all. So I, I think, yes, that's true that they're going to want to. And to the extent that we can collectively articulate the challenges with being ready to move fast absolutely uh because right it's easy to say well we can't give them the money they aren't ready to do it well what does it take to be ready to do it um i want to check with uh folks online carrie and jennifer anything you want to uh, weigh in on this not that's okay okay and peter kilman i see your hand is up go ahead peter uh thank you um, I, I want to make an observation, uh, something like what Bill is just talking about. It's not just money. It's, sure, it's about money, but it's also about how the money is allocated. And one of the problems that we have is we have a Republican governor and a Republican, very fiscally tightly controlled. Uh, uh, and so the legislature needs to write these bills in ways that the that the that the administration can't hold on to that money and do with it what it wants to do and where it wants to do it. There's a huge imbalance of where the money is spent. There's a huge imbalance. I mean, I mean, uh, j just in human services alone, it's very difficult for our agencies to get the money when the money is is sent more often to Chittenden where they've got shovel ready projects. A, a city like Burlington has the capacity to develop those shovel ready projects so they get them. So it's it does tie into to bills. So the work I think if you guys the lobbyists can help the legislature write some of their bills in ways that really don't permit the administration to sit on the money and and so forth. The second thing, which is related to that, is that it, it, it is a question. It's a little bit what happened to the heat standard. Who is going to make the decisions about implementation? Um, is it going to be an, a state agency or is it going to be a, you know, I mean, the legislature wanted the PUC to make, make the decision. And, you know, that's what why uh, Scott vetoed it, because he wants to make the decision. All right. So 
or or he said, make the legislature tell us who should make the decision. Don't throw it to the PUC. So it's not just about money. Uh, it's really about how the bills are written and giving the legislature more power to get the money to distributed much more uh, robust, uh, much more fairly and equitably than it has been. I, I'd be curious to get some reaction to that from the from the uh, Leonine people. Thank you. Thank you. I think just generally makeup, um, the makeup being what it is now, 104 uh, supermajority in the House, um, you know, 109 if you count the progressives. So I think going forward, it's going to be interesting to see how the administration reacts to that, if they're still vetoing everything, um, or if we're going to see a little bit more, uh, we're going to see the legislature maybe pushing things through that they wouldn't be able to normally. Um, do you have anything to say generally, though, to the funding piece? No, I, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's the sort of shift in dynamic we're all interested to see given what happened in the election and how that plays out and and um you know and in, in how the legislation is crafted and the, the money is appropriated I, I i would expect that that sort of shift in the balance of power will will probably lead the democrats who controls things to be um more ambitious maybe with their with where they're putting the money super I'm also very interested to see the answer to that. <laughs> <I guess. laughs> uh, um, well, uh, this is great. I the, all of these things are um, uh, ideas, advocacy points that I feel good about that I could get behind, and um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to working more on them. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, any uh, any further comments about any of this? Checking online. Okay, um, so I think we need a motion. Is anybody up for making a motion? Sure. Yes, go ahead, Kyle. We'll move to approve the 2023 legislative agenda. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any uh, further discussion, Jack? So to clarify, you're making a motion to tell yourself what to do. <laughs> and I want you to read this in front of him. Say, remember you moved the approval of this. Follow the state house with that. <laughs> Me and them a copy every day. There you go. I don't like my <laughs> That's good. Uh, okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. And opposed. Okay. So that is unanimous. Um, passes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank it's you really for having helpful. us. Yeah. For it's sure. To work with you all again. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I think we are ready to get back to the office station. <laughs> uh, okay, so we are up to the energy update. And for that, we have Chris Lumbra. Welcome. Hello. So I think I know most of you to one degree or another from different contexts, but thank you for having me today. Um, as you as you're all aware, I have been hired to be the uh, sustainability and facilities coordinator for the city. Um, also been appointed the ADA coordinator. All these, all these pieces kind of work pretty nicely together. So um, <clears throat> I'm excited. It's been a very steep learning curve and uh, really a lot going on the last couple months, really. Um, <clears throat> but I'm digging my teeth in and getting going here. So um, um, start here, um, start with EVs. Um, we have identified um, what we think is the most likely candidate for the city's, city's first EV in our fleet. Um, and that would be the uh, engineering car that the public works department uses on this, this vehicle historically uses about 450 gallons of gas a year, which puts it on, on pretty close par with the, the light duty pickup trucks that Public Works uses for, for daily operations. So um, it's a good fit in that way. Um, and 
So that um, that vehicle is slated to be replaced in FY24. And the anticipation is that it goes out to bid as, as an EV uh, once the budget's approved in March and uh, hopefully to take delivery beginning of the fiscal year. Uh, <clears throat> and to support this vehicle or to support electrification, right? We need chargers. Every, everybody's aware of that. Um, and my my initial understanding was that we we really wanted to get a DC fast charger at the public works facility for to support operations. Um, I think we're we're a little bit out ahead of ourselves. I've, I've kind of gotten some expert opinions that that support this, um, <clears throat> and it's very expensive. Um, some of you I think are aware, but uh, in order to have DC fast charging at public works. Um, there's about $50,000 worth of primary power infrastructure work that has to be done in preparation to that. So that, um, the charger itself is about $50,000 installed. There's about $50,000 in additional work that needs to be done before that. Um, and I think right now the thinking is that we're going to try and try and queue up the infrastructure work so that we will be able to be more nimble when, when the time comes to get this charger in place. Um, to support the, um, engineer's car, the best, the best, um, option sounds like it's going to be level two chargers at city, city hall, much less expensive, easier to install faster, that type of thing. Um, uh, to, to be perfectly candid, I've been working very hard on the level, level three charger at the public works garage and really all of this information is emergent to me in, the, in just literally days. So I have not really had time to do a lot of research into the, the level two charge installation here. Um, however, in, um, and I forgot to mention this at MEAC last night, but in my discussions with Green Mountain Power about the, the needs of the level three chargers, um, their transportation, EV, EV, EV transportation specialist, Zach Casey, let me know that they are very interested in, they, Green Mountain Power, in installing level three chargers in downtown Montpelier. And I said, please, 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 let's, let's have one at City Hall, you know? Um, so they're going to look at, look at infrastructure. This would be a public charger. Um, and I think this would be a great location for it. And, and supports our mission, uh, sends, sends a really great message and, you know, kind of bonus, it brings people to town for an hour to go over to Three Penny and have a burger or whatever. Uh, so kind of, I, I have not heard back from him, but he sounded excited and very willing to, to investigate that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of EVs and chargers, um, district heat, um, we are definitely interested in increasing usership of district heat. Um, there are, as you all know, there are cost, cost challenges, obstacles, that type of thing. Um, but uh, there, is, there is a possibility to leverage some, some money from, uh, Bill, Bill's much more aware of the money as I, than I am, and, uh, but there, there is some carrots. There are some carrots. And we do have one uh, very promising group of owners that have between five and seven buildings, depending how far we we extend our main lines, that are they're quite interested in talking about this. They have kind of initially asked for uh, a little bit of support from us, helping with the connections and, of course, the line extensions and that type of thing to kind of soften the initial costs and, and we're looking into that, but it's so far initial, initial discussions are promising for increasing usage of district heat. Um, so the kind of sustainable facilities piece, um, I think so. So my office has moved from City Hall to the Public Works Garage, 
Um, and frankly, before having an office down there, I had been to that facility maybe once or twice, right? Um, and I'm much more familiar with it. And I kind of would just like to share information about the campus with you to, to help you understand better what we're thinking down there. <laughs> um, and when I say campus, it's it's really, it's the streets and water department. It's not the treatment plant that I'm, I'm including in the campus. And at that, at that facility, there's, there's two large buildings. Um, and I think kind of interchangeably, they get referred to as the public works garage. Um, the, the people who use them daily call one building the garage, which houses a handful of offices, five, four or five, six offices there. And it's the repair shop for all the equipment. And it's also um, staging area and storage for water, water sewer parts and pieces and that type of thing. Workshop for those guys as well. <laughs> that building is, as I said, primarily offices and repair space and break room for, for rank and file workers. And the other building down there is um, known as the equipment bar. And that is where all our trucks and snow plows and snow blowers live when they are not out working. Um, <laughs> The um, all of all of that campus is currently heated with fuel oil. Um, there's a there's a hot water boiler that heats the garage office building, and that uses about 2,500 gallons of fuel a year. There's a backup generator there that consumes somewhere around 500 gallons of diesel fuel a year in its exercises and and periodic testing and that type of thing. And the big user down at that facility is the equipment bar. So that uses 4,000 gallons of fuel a year. Um, and it's a huge open metal building with overhead doors on both ends that are opened repeatedly throughout the day. Um, so as, as I was familiarizing myself with the campus, I, I went into this building, I looked around, I was like, holy cow, these doors, how, how, how do we ever heat this thing? Um, and it turns out as I really kind of got walked through, walked through procedures down there, the real, the real heating issue with that building is lies, lies in its mission. And it, it, it is tasked with thawing out literally 50 tons of frozen steel every night in the wintertime, right? All, all our trucks come in there and they're zero degrees. And it's, it's a huge thermal mass that's transient through that building. Um, current heating system in that building is an absolute dinosaur of a wall-mounted hot air furnace that blows blows hot air way way up high into this cavernous building, um, and it has it has multiple failures. It's really old. It's it's literally there are pieces of it held together with electrical tape right now. There are obsolete parts that it needs for repair that just aren't available. Um, and it's well beyond its service life. Uh, as that building stands, it does not lend itself well to, to heating with hot water. Um, the heat that will be generated from the, from the wastewater treatment upgrades will be coming in the form of hot water. Um, so after really kind of working with the stakeholders and wrapping my heads around my head around this, um, I, I really recommend the best solution for that that building uh, and the concrete slab on the floor is failing. It's got reinforcing steel coming through it from salt exposure. It's got a failed trench drain in it where all the, all the melted snow goes that needs, needs repairs as well. Um, so at this point, my recommendation is that take the slab out of there, put in a new insulated slab with, with heating tubing in it for radiant heat. And it's this thing with the addition of a heat exchanger and, and a few pumps is 100% ready to accept waste heat, like a huge amount of waste heat from the treatment plant as soon as that's available. Um, right now, we are, um, and when I say right now, as you all know, we're, we're working through budget and everybody is really, really busy, but um, we are, we're trying to get legal review of the bond wording and would my preference, my recommendation right now is that if legal says that it's okay, I would divert the, the a portion at least of the quarter million dollar bond 
which was originally written to put a pellet boiler down there toward this slab, slab removal and replacement in the public works garage. Um, anyway, as I've already kind of detailed, it cures a bunch of, a bunch of failures and, and maintenance problems with that building. And it's for the mission of that building of thawing out trucks having the heat down here is it's just it's ideal it's so uh, and i've i've gotten really really rousing support from from experts and and stakeholders all around this project nobody nobody thinks it's anything but exactly what we should do um uh, we we being kurt modica and myself had a meeting with um efficiency vermont last thursday at the barn to discuss this project efficiency vermont loves the project uh, the real question with this is is how much heat do we, are we going to get from from the treatment plant upgrades um and i kind of cornered kurt today and um made him cry uncle uh he 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 said that probably six months from now we'll have a really a, a pretty good idea how much heat we'll have to work with um and efficiency vermont has has said that they'll be able to help with the engineering costs to to make that determination. So phase one of the engineering for that whole project rollout will kind of yield this number. Okay, um, so that's uh, I'm I'm really excited about this. I think I think this is going to be it's going to be a good fit and it's it's going to serve the city well. And I hope that everything aligns to really really make this happen. Um, so. On to the garage office building there, um, both in both in our net zero plan and our 2011-2013 uh, capital needs assessment, the windows in that building are called out. They're they are just terrible. They're they're also failing. There's glass that's not quite falling out, but it's you know the glazing glazing's missing. There's cracks in all the wood framing. The you know the I'm sure they need to be air sealed around the windows. Well, going in and air sealing with a bunch of spray foam and windows that need to be replaced anyhow is kind of <laughs> working against yourself, right? Um, but um, so windows, window replacement there is is a project that we're working on. Um, and um, funding, I, I really haven't wrapped my head quite around that. It may be that there's enough enough money left in the bond if it's, if the wording can be interpreted broadly enough to to include energy efficiency upgrades, um, win windows aren't terribly expensive. It's it's on the order of twenty five thousand dollars installed for the, I, I think twenty six windows total down there, something like that. Um, there's also a fair amount of air sealing that's just kind of going to be tedious work. That, um, it honestly, it may just be Chris with a can of spray foam <laughs> going around. It, it, that may be the most efficient way to get this done. Um, but it's it's not something that I've had time to investigate in detail. I know I kind of know where it needs to happen, but I haven't lifted ceiling tiles and kind of inspected stuff, put my own eyes on it, but uh, certainly something we can do. Um, also that building would love cold climate heat pumps for, for the office spaces. So this, it's, as I've described it, it's kind of a dual function building. There's shop areas, there's storage areas. There, there's some large areas of that building that don't need to be heated to, to ambient temperature right so we can hopefully set back some thermostats put cold climate heat pumps in the offices the offices are all small it would be fairly small units um and hopefully get us a, a decent reduction on our fossil fuel usage just just by doing that right um and i know we don't really get 100 percent net zero credit for this but the the cold climate heat pumps would be much more efficient than the, the half dozen window unit air conditioners that we have there that are just rattling away in plywood panels where there used to be glass type thing. Um, but the, the installer ensured me that, that the cold climate heat pumps in cooling mode are literally 10 times as efficient as these, these stupid little window units. So kind of a double benefit there. Um, and also that the, um, Public Works Barrage building does have hydronic heat. Um, it's baseboards, baseboard heat in the offices and, and ceiling mounted hot water unit heaters in, in the bigger spaces. All of that and 
depending how much heat we get from from the treatment plant, it's a matter of extending insulated underground pipes over and putting in a heat exchanger in the boiler room there and picking up that heat load as well, all of it, hopefully. It, it's, it, there's really, nobody has a good guess how much heat we're gonna get from there. But if, if the stars align and we get a bunch of heat, then it, it really could quite easily heat that, heat that entire campus. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're working towards. Uh, so there's kind of facility facilities upgrades um, or, or sustainability facilities upgrades, um, just facilities, repair, maintenance, that type of stuff. I've been working on that as well and um, have, like I said, spent some time with the, the capital needs assessment, which was first written in 2011 and updated in 2013. And there's, there's a lot of big projects on there that haven't been touched and the, the, everything that was wrong then is worse now, right? Um, so we're, we're, we've kind of worked together and highlighted the, the biggest issues on there, the biggest kind of needs and are internally prioritizing these and really, we wanna get these on the table and, and say, you know, listen, this, this is what we're up against and, how can we how can we pay for this stuff right it's um so um put a fair amount of work into that and kelly's been very helpful and we, we hope to make good progress on that um also with my facilities hat on you see the light the light's not flickering <laughs> we took care of that um so i i've actually had kind of clear priorities we had council, um, and it, LED bulbs as well. So we, we got an upgrade in the process. Um, so Bertus, our, our custodian and facilities guy has been sick for more than a week now. He's, he's, had, uh, he's got a fairly, he's having troubles with a respiratory thing, an infection, that type of thing. So I've kind of been filling in for him. Um, and that's, I guess that that's part of this job, right? It's other duties as a sign bill, right? Um, so shoveling steps this morning and kind of making sure the bathrooms aren't absolutely disgusting and calling in backup when needed, that type of thing. Um, it's a lot. It, it is a lot. This, this job is, um, but we're, we're, we're working at it. Uh, I've also been up to the Country Club Road property a few times and and made sure that the heat got turned on up there. The heat heat got turned off in the transfer between the private owner and the city and got the heat on, got that building kind of stabilized. So we're not going to have any catastrophes up there with cold weather coming. Um, and um, lastly, kind of starting to begin to review just city hall, mostly operations and maintenance procedures here and trying to just make this place a little nicer and, and make it work better. Um, and then as the, as the ADA coordinator, my, my biggest priority immediately is going to be addressing the elevator here and getting the, um, we've got nagging control issues that were identified in the transition plan. Also in the, also uh, uh, there's a fair amount of stuff in here that's overlapping between CNA and, and net zero or CNA and, and ADA. Uh, so we're going to, I'm sure we're going to have to go back out to bid with that. There's a, uh, uh, there's a currently misplaced file that has the historical information on that that I haven't had time to really search for, but there's, um, let me take that and get to work on that as well. Uh, and that kind of has us up to the minute. I'd welcome any questions if anybody. Well, first of all, thank you. Oh my gosh, that was a lot. There's a, so appreciate that you are already like so deep into this. That's great. Um, and I have a couple of questions, but uh, maybe other folks have questions. Okay. Um, uh, I'm just going to go through it in the order that you talked about it. So with EVs, awesome. Thank you for um, doing all the research about uh, the infrastructure work that needs to happen. Uh, do you have a sense of, I, I think it makes sense, right, to do the, the infrastructure work now um ahead of the of a fast charger for the garage um 
do you have a sense of what the time frame on that might be? If not, that's okay. I, just, I don't. Okay, that's fine. I don't. Um, that's, I, I can, but even just like identifying, like this is what we need to do first. Like, okay, that's yeah, that's helpful. I, um, yeah, and you know, thinking about like level two chargers here, you know, because they're because we have the one um, right here, but that's obviously it's for the public. Are you thinking of like if we had one for municipal, like like for this engineering vehicle? Um, what do you anticipate that that would also be? publicly accessible or is that just going to be like this is just dedicated to I would I would like for it to be publicly accessible mm -hmm. as long as we're able to kind of restrict access to it when we need it you know yeah. and maybe it's as simple as a sign saying you know this this vehicle is reserved for I, basically I believe the public works vehicle is going to charge overnight here um, so oh, no, okay. no overnight parking in this spot this vehicle is reserved for okay so that I was just trying to think like how would how could you you know, match that, but I guess charging overnight would, yeah. would do it. That, that makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for all that clarity around the two uh, buildings on the uh, garage campus, basically. Um, it's confusing, right? It's, yeah. It's... Well, and like I, one of the tours that I did a long, a long time ago now, we went to the the equipment barn and so i was you know yeah. it, as you were describing it i was like yeah right it is a big open yeah and space certainly to, to kind of piggyback on this if if any or all of you ever wanted to schedule a tour to go down there and look at the places i'd i'd love to walk you through it be it, yeah i think it'd be informative for everyone um so the one concern I have about that, I mean, first of all, like, I love the idea of radiant floor heating for that space. I, I think, you know, as you were describing it, right? Like, so you have a, a mounted blower basically filling up the upper half with hot air, you know, like that doesn't make much sense. So, um, but of course, like these trucks are coming in with salt and grease and, you know, all, you know, whatnot. And so that's, that's really hard on the, well, any material that's on the ground. Um, do we know if there are any other places, uh, any other municipalities that have a radiant floor uh, storing space? I, I haven't asked that. Haven't asked that question. Okay, um, that would be interesting. Yeah. I mean, because of course, like if we're, if you're going to do radiant floor heating, it's kind of like, I mean, my I I'm a layperson basically, right? So I don't really know these. I'm just asking questions. So I sure you know, <laughs> I'm not an expert, uh, but. Uh, my understanding anyway is that sort of like once you do radiant floor heating it's really hard to change that right like it's because it's if it's sort of like embedded um then if it needed to be resurfaced or uh, you know if it's if there's corrosion happening right because of the salt because of all the you know fun chemicals that end up on it right um i guess i would just want to make sure that we do it in a way that hopefully can be like the surface can be can be redone without damaging or needing to dig up the radiant floor heating. Does that make sense? Okay, absolutely. I, I can definitely speak to your concerns. Oh, okay. Um, so the slab that's in there is almost 40 years old. Um, the real Sorry, reason- did you say four or- 40. 40, four zero, okay. 40, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, and it just- really looking at the slab and how it's failing it they they just didn't get the rebar deep enough in it the, the reinforcing steel is in places within a half inch of the surface so, so quality control when this thing is is put in place to make sure that we get proper coverage of the rebar is really gonna really gonna protect it so the 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 reinforcing steel is so close to the surface small cracks let water get in there water salted water get in there yeah. The steel starts rusting, expanding, flaking, and then it pops. The concrete exposes more rebar. It's kind of a cycle. Um, so quality control when we build the slab, num number one, we could easily expect a 40-year life out of it, uh, yeah. which this this slab put in without the benefit of, of stringent quality control has lasted 40 years. Um, and um, so that's I, I think that's going to be our friend on the way in. There are also just 
myriad sealers. We, we need to find the right sealer to protect the surface of this concrete and, you know, set it up, set up a schedule and reapply this stuff and, and take, take, you know, take proactive steps to protect this thing, which yeah. that hasn't happened in the life of the existing slab either. Um, and so just to talk, talk to about the melting water and salt, um, I said, there is a, a trench drain in there. The trench drain still functions, but it clogs easily. It doesn't, it doesn't work quite as well as it does. It doesn't work well. It need, needs a lot of help. Um, grates are rusted, that type of thing. But I wanted to be real clear that that trench drain is connected to an oil water separator, number one. And obviously it's oil and all kinds of crap coming off there. And then the, the water that comes from the separated oil is, does go into sanitary sewer and gets treated as sewage. It's not. So we're, we are already handling that properly and would continue to do so. Okay. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think so. Uh, the, and the other, other question I have uh, is uh, with the office building down there. So are you, are you thinking about doing both um, cold climate heat pumps and hoping to get heat from the water resource recovery facility? Yes. Okay. Uh, but I guess we'd we'd still have the the cooling problem down there, right? We'd yeah. still be we'd still be married to window units if we didn't do cold climate heat pumps. And right. um, and again, I know I know that's yeah. that's not a lot of not a lot of fossil fuel usage that that's saved by that. But you know, operational, um, we could certainly look at try try and get a number. It's going to be kind of tricky to pull that out and there's going to be a little bit of estimation in the process but you know how much money is this going to save us just in cooling cooling load and what's the payback right? yeah, um, yeah well and if, oh, sorry. if uh if our initial estimates from from the treatment plant say you know what you're going to have you're going to have more heat than you know what to do with then maybe we pivot and we take take another look at this and say okay this maybe this isn't Maybe this isn't the best use of our resources, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I almost wonder, like, if you do the cold climate heat pumps, then why connect to the water resource recovery facility? Well, there's still um, um, there's still going to be a, a a load on that boiler, right? It mm -hmm. it does it does heat all the workshop area. Well, it heats some of the workshop areas in there to say 60 degrees instead of 65 or 68 or whatever. Um, and then storage rooms are probably heated to a lower lower temperature than that. Um, okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. I think the idea was to put the heat pumps where the people are mm -hmm. working, and then mm -hmm. the rest of the building could be could be with the, the heat pump. Yeah. Yeah. Water resource recovery facility. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, cool. Thank you. Sure. This is very helpful. Okay. Um, other questions, Jack, and then Lauren. Thanks, Chris. Um, <laughs> I I couldn't put my finger on it, but it seems to me that we had a report or an analysis from the Energy Advisory Committee about where the potential excessive use of energy is and where the potential savings are. And am I right in thinking that the the Public Works campus was the the highest priority for for doing that yes yep good um obviously there are some savings opportunities here in this building and also some human comfort uh opportunities that you're also looking at um with regard to the uh to the charger uh, if we're talking about putting a hundred thousand dollars into a charger that's going to charge one vehicle obviously that's not <laughs> a particularly efficient use of the uh, money so do we have a do we have a, like a, a bigger list of what, what vehicles we would be moving to convert to electric uh, in future years yes yes um so all of and and i'm um, Focus mostly on public works fleet right now. These are these are our real fuel users. Um, 
the police department currently has two hybrid vehicles. They're not, they're not plug-ins. They are hybrid cruisers. Um, and the idea, and I've got to understand this a little more. There's so much, so much technical information to, to digest, but basically police cars are built and tested to their, their very own standards. They, they have to, do X, Y, and Z and crash testing and, and all of all of these really stringent requirements where, um, it, and this is very new information to me. I've never, never been in a position to, to even consider it, but it's not just put a blue light on the roof of a Tesla and you have a police car. It's, it's, <laughs> um, so there's just right now there aren't, suitable suitable police vehicles other than these these hybrids mm. um unfortunately because th those are the those are the ones that really log the miles right they um but there is there is a replacement schedule back to your original question there's a replacement schedule for all public works vehicles um, and they're typically on a six to ten year cycle depending on the piece of equipment and the plan is as as each as each vehicle ages out and is ready for trade-in, we put it out to bid as an EV and hopefully find suitable candidates. So I, I will qualify this and say that, you know, perfectly suitable candidates for a lot of these vehicles do not exist, right? There's, there's heavy trucks, that type of thing. Uh, so the, uh, the, the level three charger, the DC fast charger, interchangeable terms, um, I think the idea is that that's available, that that's going to charge a fairly large battery pack in an hour. Um, hopefully when the future comes that we have electric dump trucks and snow plows and that type of thing with just a little bit of schedule coordination, those things can come in, plug in for an hour, driver takes a break or takes a different piece of equipment. This thing charges, it goes back out. The next you know, truck 37 comes in, plugs in, charges. So one fast charger in the course of you know winter operations could be almost continually charging vehicle after vehicle after vehicle mm -hmm. with you know and it, that's some operational stuff that that we haven't even begun to discuss but it it seems fairly elementary and simple to, to and i think our to just to amplify that to you know to to that point is and chris and i have talked about this a fair amount which is we're so far away from really being able to convert the fleet there um you know when we look at that schedule um and and you know it, the thinking was well then yes we need to invest a hundred thousand but is it smart to build put that charger in now and have it sit unused for four or five years when we could get one out here that would only be charging the one the one vehicle for now but if we were able to get others but also the public vehicles were we're furthering greater goals and not, you know, kind of more of a just in time when we watch the fleet because eventually they're they're going to be there, but they're not there yet. And you know, obviously, then we've got fire trucks, and you know, it may just be that we'll have a fleet of police hybrids for a while before they go fully electric, and that's that's an improvement. It's not perfect, but it's an improvement. And I don't know if you, I don't know how much time you spend watching city council meetings before you got this job, but. People will, will tell you that pretty much every time we're asked to approve a purchase of another vehicle, <clears throat> I or someone else on the council is going to say, so did you look for an electric vehicle for that? <laughs> no. Um, and so just to follow up on vehicles, just in just a little bit more detail, um, I, I did have a conversation with Kurt today. I, I didn't get a chance to talk to Zach, who's, who's the more more direct person for this, but I, I've begun to question our, our existing model of vehicle procurement. It seems like we, we send out a specification. We say, okay, we need a truck that can do X, Y, and Z. It needs to tow a 6,000 pound trailer and it needs to be able to haul X number of pounds of payload and it needs four wheel drive, plowing, whatever. Whatever the truck needs, we write a specification to that. And it goes out to a number of dealers and we ask for bids, um, and there, there's uh, 
there are state fleet discounts that get passed down to the cities that we we are able to take advantage of. And um, it sounds like the the last time a vehicle went out to bid, which I, I guess was probably last spring, they they the specification said preference given or or we 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 want this to be an EV, and nobody came. N- none of the usual suspects came back to bid on the EV, right? Uh, I'm, I kind of questioned how how motivated these these dealers we're working with are to to meet the EV specification. And I, I asked her, you know, is it time to really take a look at, I, I know this is how we've done it for 50 years or however long, but this is this is a new landscape. And let's take a closer look at how we how we source these vehicles and maybe we can we can set something up that's going to be more successful than they they letting them say or or giving them a, an opportunity to say no we don't have that here's a gas truck it's mm-hmm. the best we can do right mm-hmm. um, so I, it's and it's just this is just a brand new idea that's kind of rattled around between my ears for a few mm-hmm. hours so and but i i want to kind of flesh this out and talk to talk to stakeholders and see see what kind of sense we can make of that process as well that's great cool I also think the idea the the heated floor idea seems like a great idea, whether it's going to be epoxy coated or something on the uh, on top of it that seems like a good way to go. I assume that would be uh, a lot better for the guys working on the trucks too. yeah that for the most part, that's not where the repair work happens. Oh, okay sometimes in in situations they stuff does get worked on there, but for the most part, the equipment barn is just a storage facility. Okay. And the repair shop is on the back of the the offices and garage building. It's been a while since I had yep. the tour. I right? should we yep. should do it again. There's there's a lot to take in there. It's, yeah, there's a lot. Thanks. Sure. You're oh, I well. should say one other thing. Uh, I think it's it's great that uh, that part of your job is also the ADA coordinator. We were on the uh, ADA committee for several years together, and uh, it's great to see us making progress. Yeah. You know, I. I give Tom McArdle a lot of credit for because he was very committed to that for many years. And... Yeah, for sure. Not to not to knock our our existing DPW team. I think I think we've got great people. I, I'm so happy with with the appointment of Kurt and Zach to the positions they're in. But Tom Tom McArdle was he was a special breed. <laughs> he really, really was. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Lauren. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a few questions. And first, I'm so excited to have you. So excited to have this role. And it's so great to see so much progress so quickly. And I know it's a lot to learn and your enthusiasm and creativity and uh, willingness to do whatever it takes. It's really appreciated. So really excited to continue working with you. Um, One question for the, um, so if we need to spend like fifty thousand dollars to do the line extension to have the phase three power for like could level two chargers serve the purpose or do we really need that constant like is this something where overnight vehicles could be or like four hour stretches or whatever like is there is there feasibility because they're so much cheaper that it could meet the need or is that not a possibility given the demand on the vehicles at crunch time if if we were at the point, and this is years down the road, if yeah. we were at the point where we had an all electric, all electric street fleet, and we were in the middle of a real a real snowstorm when it's all hands on deck, all machinery working, snow removal, all of that stuff, a, a ten level two chargers wouldn't be enough. We we it would definitely hamper our operations. Hmm. And that, yeah, not to interrupt, but I just want to weigh in because, at least for now, and this is something we might look at in the future, but that the gasoline site there, the the is also serves all our other vehicles, so police and that kind of thing. So you know, having a police cruiser that's doing its shift and go down there and have to sit for four hours. I mean, I suppose they could put it in when it's you know, but if in the middle of the night someone needs a chart, you know, I think it's. Uh, you know, whereas maybe they would use the one here uh, 
So I think yeah. we need to think strategically. There may be multiple locations for these and not just yeah. one. I guess that was my next question is, multiple is I mean, I love the idea of the downtown level three that the city could use um, as we build out the electric fleet and that the public could use. I mean, I think having a location that seems great, definitely move forward with that. I mean, I guess, I mean, obviously you want it to be as convenient as possible, but I don't know if there's any other sites where we already have phase three power or something where we don't have to pay for the line upgrade. I'm sure that will be, <laughs> you can think about that, but, you know, maybe there's a location where we're not spending the 50,000, but yeah. I mean, if not, I do think, you know, obviously getting ourselves ready for, I mean, we're just in the midst right now, like the state is signing on to California, the zero Michigan, zero emission vehicles and, um, zero emission trucks for heavy fleets um, by 2035, manufacturers are gonna only be able to sell. So I think this transition is gonna be coming quicker than we think as the manufacturers are totally retooling to electric. So um, I think being ready makes total sense. And, you know, just that's that's what we should be doing and it's where everything's headed. So I think, you know, whatever whatever we can do in that, but I guess, you know, if there's a way to save the 50, <laughs> you know, would love it. Well, it also may be, when, you know, I mean, I think, if you look the other way, though, you know, if once the three phase power is there, it's there. And, and you know, it could be in the future, we're going to need more than one charger there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, then we have the capacity to have a bank of them as, yeah. as needed, you know, to expand as the fleet expands. Yeah. So it's a kind of a one time Great. investment to be able to have a sustainable program. Yeah. So I don't I don't know that it's a bad idea. Yeah. Really. One. Uh, I, and so one one other thing I'd add that I have learned about. EV chargers specific to the public works facility campus down there. Um, it's it's not even unlikely that during some of these snow events we'll lose power. Um, and unfortunately, our backup generator that that powers the public works campus right now is nowhere near nowhere near robust enough to to feed a level level three charger. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Under those circumstances, obviously it's it's emergency emergency planning at that point. It's it's a, not a common event, but it's not an unlikely event. Um, the generator will run level two chargers, so it, I I think we definitely need a, a blend of them down there, mm -hmm. and we may find ourselves in a situation where you know what level two charging's it's what we have until until the grid comes back. You mm -hmm. know, where uh, I mean. As much as people like to mock the idea of charging electric cars with, with fuel power generators, it's it's this isn't an optional thing. It, this is a necessity, and it's what we do. And and worst case, it makes makes our EVs temporarily the equivalent of the diesels that they replaced, but only only very temporarily. Great. Um, just one other um, word on the bond and the heating i mean i really hope that we we get the the advice that we can move forward with the proposal as you've laid out and it does uh, make me think we were talking a little bit at the energy advisory committee last night like these types of projects and knowing that as like the research and technology if they can be maybe we need to think about writing them with like the goal in mind and some more flexibility and you know naming a specific technology i mean i like the direction and like that we're trying to implement our net zero plan and stuff. But like, if we're finding that there's actually a better option that still meets the goal at the location that we want to do right. it, maybe um, just a, a flag right. for bonding wording to make sure that if we get it, you know, maybe it will be great and fine. And that's what I'm hoping. Um, but maybe we could keep that in mind. <laughs> well, I wonder if, uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt no. if you, um, I'm just speculating here. If the advice is not that, you know, it said this and this is what we have to keep to, I wonder if we put something on the ballot that says to your public, you can you you give can, us permission to. You can vote to repurpose or reword the purpose. Of, okay. Uh, that's so possible. So actually it could be timely because we could, we could add that, you know. Yeah. This much. Yeah. I, and, uh, depending on the timing of when we get this right. advice, it might be good to start thinking about that now anyway. Um Cool. Anything else? Okay. I, I'd like yeah. to just piggyback on what what Lauren just said and and say, you know, future planning. Let's, you know, I'm happy certainly with a little bit of advance notice to 
maybe not make myself an expert in in any given subject, but do some do some research and be able to give thoughtful advice as to you know we want to do we want to achieve this goal and we're we're going to write a bond for it and what do you think yeah. and and you know kind of pull together the stakeholders and really really be deliberate about the wording of that and as you know they, I'm all new to this but it's how important is the wording of the bond it's 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 life or death right or not not life or death well, we don't know we'll, it, we'll see yeah it's it's important it matters and if we can take um, steps to if I can speculate a little bit here I feel like I mean maybe this just because I'm transitioning to this new role at some point and thinking about other municipalities in the area right like and Montpelier is unique in that we have um, a lot more capacity than lots of smaller towns, right? Um, I may, this probably happens already, but I'm just anticipating that, you know, there may be a lot of municipalities that don't have the expertise that you are putting together right now. And I'm just, I, I, I hope, I'm sure that it's, you know, at some point other municipalities are going to be like, you know, we want to pick your brain to see like how do we you know if we're we're redoing our own garage what do we do like we heard that you put in a radiant floor or like just things like that how did that go what was that like you know, but, just, I, yeah I'd, I'd love to help yeah, with anything like yeah. that um that's a, a separate thing but uh i do have one other question which is that at one point we had before us a policy to that would uh, have required that the city transition all of its buildings off of oil by 2030, whether or not the systems, like the heating systems that they're on, were due for replacement. Um, and I mean, the other part of it was that, like, as the heating systems come up for replacement, that we replace them with something non fossil fuel based. And we, we sort of punted on that to collect information you know data on um how much that was going to cost us or um just to do some more research uh do you have any thoughts on such a policy um I mean, I, I think that is the that is the net thirty net thirty goal, net zero twenty thirty goal is yeah. to be off fossil fuels. Um, I, you know, we're we're pretty lucky. Fire station, police here, we're on district heat. We're we're no fossil fuels to heat this building. No. The, I mean, a big wild card is our our rec center on Berry Street. What what in the world is going to happen to that building? Uh, I. I mean, I, I have my personal opinions about that, and that that being that that building is obsolete. It does not serve the city well, and um, the idea of taking out an oil boiler in there and and spending a few hundred thousand dollars to convert it to a pellet boiler to still have an inaccessible dinosaur of a building does not make sense to me. To be honest with you, I. Um, I envision a future that that building gets deemed obsolete and gets sold off. What whatever happens to that building, um, I, I think. So a building like that, I, I'd push back if you said, "Chris, we really want to put a pellet boiler in, in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the rec center." No. I, I'd really want to be thoughtful about that and and be sure of the direction we we're going. Um, <clears throat> They've, but that is sorry to interrupt. But that is one of the projects we talked about when you first came on. I know you've had a lot. What was evaluating the heat systems in each building and what it would take yeah. to convert and the cost. It was yeah. part to that proposed policy. I mean, I think I do think the rec center is a, an outlier. But you know, already our senior center has they've got a pellet boiler well, already. You know, presumably anything we build at Country Club Road, we would build you know more modern. If we can do this huge conversion at the public work charge, we're really down to you know the the stuff at the rec field and we don't have that many more the water treatment plant right it's about it but you know we don't have that much more to go yeah. so um i think i, I think we're without well, we can't put a number on it but i think it's we're, we're on the way so 
to reasonable Great. policy. Yeah. And and similar to the to the Berry Street Rec Center, the the country club complete country club road property is it's it's a wild card right now we need to we need to see what white and bark has to say about it if i mean it's we'll, we'll see what they say about that building and and how well how well that can or or can't serve the city and again make try and make an intelligent decision about mm -hmm. what we'll do up there right yeah you know i appreciate uh you're you know thinking around like the the rec building and um so i i guess i wonder if well and and also i appreciate your thinking that that really this policy that we're talking about might effectively be an extension of the net zero policy that we already have adopted right like it's almost like a clarification um it's it's almost implied, right? Um, I mean, that's that's what I understand. My mission as a sustainability coordinator to be is to yeah to do all we can to uh, get off fossil fuels. Yeah, you know it's it's tempting to like okay, well then we should just pass it. But that part of me is also like, do we need to? Because it's already maybe, you already have. maybe we've already have passed it. Anyway, it's something I might have some just offline conversations about, like whether or not we need to. Maybe we don't, but whatever. Let's. So one, one yeah. more thing I would share that I I certainly was not aware of this, and it's, it's good news, got some good news. Um, still trying to familiarize myself with city facilities. I've spent the, the 10 years I worked as building inspector primarily in City Hall. Um, so I went over the other day and, and spent some time with Patrick Healy and got to know the Green Mountain Cemetery campus and facility and buildings over there. Um, Completely unknown to me, Patrick has uh, he has switched over as much as possible to these really heavy duty battery powered trimmers and and that type of thing. I wasn't sure if council was was aware of that, but I thought that was super cool. So these things are, are like huge backpack battery that plugs into these trimmers, and they're not like my stupid battery trimmer at home that cuts for half an hour and you have to go get another battery these things he said run for four hours on the charge and he's super happy with them they're they're powerful they don't they don't diminish his operations in any any way shape or form they're quiet you don't you're not breathing the two cycle exhaust he he really loves them and um i i was i was really pleased to to see that you know patrick had taken that on himself to to research these things and find find these tools that, that really work well for him and inadvertently or, or intentionally i guess helped us helped us meet this goal i did ask him the the sixty four thousand dollar question bill how much fuel do these replace and he said i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> but they, it's it's a lot and and i know i i think i understand that i mean so a gallon of gas creates 20 pounds of carbon carbon dioxide right that's that's how it is it doesn't matter if it's in a car with a catalytic converter that's that's exhaling clean exhaust or it's it's a gallon of gas that gets mixed with oil and burned through a two-stroke which is incredibly dirty in so many other ways but it's like the small small engines are you know air pollution there, there's a bunch of other stuff that comes with those so that's to me it's 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 not going to be a huge fuel savings but it's there, there's other benefits as well right totally um and this is something that I, I feel like I've been having this conversation with DBW folks for some Rec. time. Rec. Rec. Yeah. So um, anyway, do you think this is something that has the potential that, that we can be switching to <laughs> um, for, for city operations? Right. Yes. Yeah. And, okay. um, and I would, I guess I would ask for a little bit of clarity on that specific issue. It's the, the biggest bang for the buck is the the biggest users, right? What, which which vehicle, which building uses the most number of gallons? But these, hey, I, I'm a little bit hung up on how dirty these small engines are. You know, even even four cycle lawnmowers are I, like an hour of that is equivalent to a couple hundred miles of car driving, right? Um, is 
how big a priority is it to us to to address air pollution in, in the form of the dirty exhaust from these small engines, right? Is it, or do we just want to really, really kind of focus on the big usage and, and try and reduce the the bulk gallon usage, you know? Um, you, go ahead, Lauren. What's the typical lifespan of that equipment? I mean, like my knee jerk would be whenever we're replacing at this point, we should be replacing. I mean, I think all of these pieces are part of the 2030 goal. Um, and yeah, we're focusing attention and resources on like the biggest reducers, but we shouldn't be replacing equipment. I don't know some of the stuff though, if it lasts for a long time, like would we have that 2030 similar to the buildings where we're trying to have replaced the whole fleet of fossil fuel equipment by then as right. well, which seems um, like- it's, uh, yeah, that, that's not clear in the, in the net zero plan for sure. Um, and the, I would say the life cycle, life, yeah, the lifespan of these pieces of equipment varies wildly. On, but that's something we can look at as we're yeah. getting equipped for sure, for sure. Place for place. Um, and again, the, the, the heavier pieces, the big wide mowers that we use for the bulk grass cutting, those, those don't exist as, as effective electrically powered equipment yet but i that's got to be in a, in a two or three year time horizon where those are available uh there exists a schedule of replacement for the this kind of equipment not the same as the vehicles do okay. i think it's i i think it exists need, but i think you know certainly we can look at that and figure out you know what's again it comes down to what's available and what's doesn't right. meet the need that we're doing the trimmers work great the mowers right. not as much you know so i think it's yeah uh, you know I, mowing I would, feels big wide open spaces you need to be able to right. kind of go and i would venture the guest and that the, the replacement schedule for these exists in the heads <laughs> of, of the people who use them daily like, yeah sure I, I'm, I'm sure if i had a conversation with with Pat Healy, he would say, yeah, this, this zero turn over here is going to be worn out in five years and, and I'll need to do it. Yeah. You know, Arnie's, Arnie's guys who were cutting grass for the rec center every day, same thing. They're, they're going to have a decent idea. Yeah. It may not be down to the. I mean, it, you asked about like how to prioritize that kind of replacement. I mean, uh, uh, in as much as it costs your time, I mean, I like I want to recognize that it's not really my job <laughs> to tell you this, right? Um, but like, if it's, uh, you know, things cost more than just money, right? Like, it seems to me that we need to be prioritizing big, big, uh, you know, emitters. Um, but if it's not, if it's not a question of time, if it's and it's not a question of money, then I, I would love to see us try to do all of the above. Because um, it, it's all, like Lauren said, you know, it's it's all a part of um, meeting the goal. And so, especially, and, and two, you know, one of the reasons to potentially do the building specific policy uh, clarification uh, is even though it's already included in or implied by our policy is that we want to, as the city, I think we want to set a good example for the rest of the community. And I think that includes, you know, with, you know, the um, trimmers, as well as like to say, you know, we, we have this policy, but here's how specifically it's going to play out. You know, we're going to, we're going to get our buildings off of oil by 2030. Um, and just making that really clear um, to, to the community as well. Yeah, I mean, so. you make a good point, right? It's, it's, at some point it's it's a matter of optics you know we're yeah. so oh i was at the pool and these guys are running around with these stinky gas trimmers the whole time and my kids had to breathe the exhaust whatever whatever right. the scenario is it's what yeah. are we doing how how are, what, what examples are we setting what kind of leadership are we showing yeah. right yeah yeah those are like little but symbolic things so um, uh cool thank you I, as usual, I could talk about this for a long time, and I apologize. Um, any, uh, uh, I just want to check in. 
uh, uh, Councillor Brown and Councillor Morton, anything you would like to weigh in on on this? Okay, just wanted to check. Um, any other thoughts, Council? Thank you so much. Sure. This has been really great. Really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to go to item eight and a half, <laughs> which is uh, discussing uh, anticipated vacancies. Um, so <laughs> on that, do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? I mean, I, I ask for the agenda item. And sure. I think it's probably more an agenda item for you all than uh, the mayor and myself here, but I uh, just want to be cognizant. We have a pretty busy budget season coming up here. And, uh, you know, I, I, I at one point had thought, like, ah, could I do the legislature and city council, you know, at the same time? But, you know, as I'm looking at the meetings I've already got going and the, the day job, obviously, uh, Hunter S. Thompson always said anything worth doing is worth doing right. And I don't think I could do it right, you know. Uh, so I want to be respectful to you all on that one. Uh, but also want to like give some notice that, you know, if, if you do need to fill the vacancy, give people enough time to apply and do it for whatever period there. So I, I would just kick off saying my intention would be for uh, December 21st to be my last meeting um, and then transition out there. I could be flexible just depending on the timing if you needed me a bit longer or something. Uh, but it, the session does start January 1st, which would be our next council meeting. And I, I just envision I'd be missing some time if that were the case. So, uh, you know, I spoke to Bill today. I, I've spoken to a few of you just one-on-one -on -one here. Uh, that'd be my hope. Uh, we, we have time for goodbyes later, but I, I will say it's definitely been one of the, the greatest privileges ever uh, serving with all of you there. And it, it's very important to me not to leave you in the lurch and, uh, you know, do right by you guys too. But that would be my plan at the moment. Yeah, uh, Lauren. Yeah, um, I don't accept your resignation. <laughs> no, but seriously, no. But um, could you remind us, Bill, the process for? I thought maybe the mayor was going to announce her to go through Later, the whole thing because they're two different. They're actually different for both seats. Yes. Yeah. So uh, similarly uh, to Connor, I. Uh, I'm just anticipating that being a, a part of the Senate is going to be a, a lot of time. And I think one of the differences uh, between uh, in this situation being a, a you know, rep versus a senator is that I, as a senator, I would represent a, a, just a different boundary um, of folks. And, and you know, I, I think it would be a question, you know, if, if I was to stay on, right, that like, well, who was I representing when I said that? Was I representing the people of Just Montpelier? Was I representing the, the folks of uh, the Washington Senate District? Uh, so anyway, I think it is it is appropriate for me to step down. And um, so I would also uh, anticipate stepping down December 21st, um, uh, the last meeting before the session starts. So uh, yeah, and I would I would also say like I'm actually having a really hard time thinking about not being here. Like this has been a part of my life for the last ten years. I'm gonna save all of that. I have a lot I have a lot to say about it, but I just want you to know like I'm I I'm having a hard time like separating my my thinking from what is happening here. Um, having said that, Bill, what is the process? So uh, it sounds like we need to get the budget done by December 21st. <laughs> so two meetings. We can handle the public hearings without you, but you got to make all the decisions on the 14th and 21st. Manager's review has to be done by the 21st. Uh, no. So the, the process that, uh, so there are two different processes. Uh, I looked them both up in the charter. I am paraphrasing by memory, but we can certainly go to it. Uh, so we'll start with the mayor. Um, when there's a vacancy in the mayor seat with more than 120 days left in their term. Now, Mayor Watson's term goes all the way till the next March. So there is clearly gonna be more than 120 days left in her term. It says the city council shall call forthwith, shall call forthwith a special election to fill the remainder of the mayor's term. 
So whenever that election is, when that person gets elected mayor, they are mayor until the end of Mayor Watson's term. So if you were to call a special election in January or February, that person would be mayor all the way until the following March. Uh, obviously, I think it makes, practically speaking, and for the city clerk's sake, it would be ideal not to have an additional election between now and town meeting, if at all possible. So, you know, the question is, you know, if she's, her, for her last meeting is the end of December, is, you know, the first Tuesday, second Tuesday, whatever, first Tuesday of March, forthwith. And probably it is. Um, that would be, we would have sort of no mayor for January and February, essentially. Um, with the council seat, it's different. It's if there's a, if there's a vacancy with more than 90 days left. And again, Connor also has a full year afterwards. So those day limits don't really come in. This is the council shall appoint a person, you know, a fill in until the next town meeting election. So even if you were to appoint someone, they would only be on, you may remember when Ashley Hill stepped down a couple of years ago, we appointed Dan Richardson and he was only on for a couple of months. They got reelected to the one year term, but his first fill in was only for six weeks or something. And so I think, so again, the question would be, so I think, so there are two different questions and I, you know, obviously no matter what, uh, Council Member Casey's one year term is going to be on the March ballot. The question is so, two questions. One, do you want to time it so that the mayor's term is on the March ballot, or do you want to have a special election? And two, do you want to fill the seat by appointment between now and March once Council Member Casey steps down or not? And it, again, there's no time limit, it just says the council shall fill by appointment doesn't say within so many days or whatever. And I, I certainly, you know, if we had many months to go, by all means, you'd want to fill it. The question is, do you want to fill it just, yeah, and it would be a new person coming in right in sort of the budget process. So it's really your decision how you want to do that, but they are different. They're different animals and need to be handled sort of separate. Jack. Thanks. I've been, I have a couple of thoughts about this. Uh, one is that, the office of vacancy in the office for one thing for neither of these act neither of the actions that the city council takes come into play until there's a vacancy so as long as the, the two of you are still on the council and serving as mayor there's no vacancy yet um with regard to the vacancy in the office of mayor it does say the city council shall forthwith direct the city clerk to call a special meeting and the way i read that it means that what has to happen forthwith is for us to tell the clerk to call the election and forth so forthwith relates to when we tell the clerk to <clears throat> do something not when the special election has to be held and i and i think it makes a ton of sense to have the uh, special election for mayor be on town meeting day, both for, because it costs a lot of time and money to hold a special election, two, we are likely to get a better uh, turnout you know, for people to coming to uh, to vote for that, which is I think is an important thing. Um, with regard to the council vacancy, one of the questions is what process we would go through. Um, and the last few times we've done it, we've uh, required anyone who wanted to be appointed to collect uh, petitions with signatures the same as if they were asking to be put on the ballot. And I, I would think that that's the way we should go so that people show some um, modicum of, of support before they, uh, they get considered. That's, that is correct. That's been the practice. And the other... So, so you you are correct. There's no more vacancy until the position steps down. However, we have in the past, in the anticipation of a vacancy, started the, the process in advance. In fact, the the mayor um, replaced Sarah Jarvis, and she said, "I'm resigning as of the end of this six weeks from now, or something." And we had a, the whole process, and 
the mayor was appointed and didn't actually take office till the next meeting and Sarah was still at the last meeting voting. So, um, you know, I think we could, in the case of an appointment, I think you can start the process, you just can't, the person can't take the seat, obviously, until the prior seat is vacated. vacated. Uh, and maybe, you know, I don't know, I'd look to the city clerk for a, a detailed ruling whether they actually, I think, that I, guess, I think what happened was they've pointed you at the close of the meeting. You took office at the close of that meeting, yep. as I recall. Yep. So she resigned as of the adjournment of that meeting, and then you were appointed mm -hmm. as of mm -hmm. after that. Yep. And, so right. that and, um, and I think we've done something similar in the past. So you could, you know, if you if you wanted to appoint someone on December 21st or in one of the January meetings, you know, we could start that process now if that's what you chose, or you could choose, like I said, not to appoint it want to that's that's your it's both of these are you know, just, just. but in you know i think it is fair to the public to know what we're going to do and how we how we can get what time we allow for people to get involved if there's going to be an appointment what that process looks like what the deadlines are that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my inclination at this point would be, I mean, I think town meeting and we can forthwith to direct John to, to do that for the mayor's seat. I mean, I would be inclined to follow the recent practice of um, someone, you know, asking for petition signatures, um, but lining it up to appoint someone. I mean, it's just a, being down two people is not giving people as you know, robust of representation as I think they deserve, even if it is that short window. So I think it's worth um, getting, you know, another voice in here, especially, you know, in budget season and lots of important decisions, just having, you know, more uh, community members participating in that seems good. So that would be my thought at this point. And would you want to... Uh, well, I'm going to just going to put this out there. Like, what is the timing that you would anticipate as ideal for an appointment? And you don't have to have an answer for that right now, but that's that's a, a question. Um, Terry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just going to agree with Lauren and um, and echo all of that. That I don't think we want a separate election, but I do think we want to to elect a new mayor on the city city meeting ballot and to try to get some a replacement for Connor in quickly. Um, I'm not sure what your question just now was about timing. What did you mean by that exactly? Well, so just thinking about the, thank you, um, by the way. So one possibility is that the timing for an appointment could happen as soon as the 21st uh, and have it like sort of similar to when I was appointed, take effect on the adjournment of that meeting? Or do we save it for uh, the next meeting when there is a, you know, a actually a vacancy? Um, or I guess, you know, do we do it before the 21st, you know, to take effect, you know, at some later point? Um, I guess those are really like the three options. Um, or well, I guess a fourth option would be to just be down a person until town meeting day. And it sounds like we're not, well, people are not, you, but I don't think we can do yeah, that. This is your policy call, but is, you know, you'd actually be down two people. Right, right, exactly. Um, Carrie, go ahead. Guys. Yeah, thanks. Um, so what I was, what I was advocating for was as soon as possible. And so if that means if, that we could appoint somebody to begin on the 22nd, you know, I don't know if we can if we can appoint them to some point in the future, but I, if at that 21st meeting, we could say, OK, you're appointed starting tomorrow so that we don't because we can't have two people on at once. Okay. Just, yeah. deciding yeah. The vacancy doesn't exist yet, so right. I don't think you're empowered to take any action. I think even if it's a minute later, even if you know who you're going to appoint, that's different you know, uh, the moment after the resignation, but I don't think you can, you can do any act to appoint them in advance of that second after the resignation happens. So does, 
does that mean we can't make an appointment on the 21st? As long as you did it, as long as it was done in the, in the correct order. I mean, as long as the resignation was received and then the appointment was made, I think it could be in the course of the same meeting because the vacancy exists as soon as the resignation happens. It's just that it doesn't exist before. Okay. I'm just remembering that it's different. Well, um, it, did, it didn't I... quite. I mean, there, it was clear that Sarah was resigning as of adjournment of that meeting and, and was appointed as of post adjournment for that meeting. But I, I, I'd i stick with the letter, though. Yeah. I mean, I okay. think you could just do, you could wait. Yeah. I think we could figure that out. We could yeah. have. Right, you know, Connor could do his official resignation during council reports, and then we could have an agenda item after that to make the appointment. And that's 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 what you'd want to do. And so I think that part could be figured out. I think the real issue, and that probably makes the most sense because you only have two meetings in December, the 14th and the 21st, and there's Thanksgiving in between. So if we were to recruit, you know, to give people time to get their signatures, to think about it, to get the word out. Um, and if you appointed someone on the 21st, assuming we do the timing right, that gives them the holidays to at least look over the budget material. And, you know, because we January is a pretty heavy budget, unless, unless we finish in December, which we did too. Hmm. And then we could have less meetings in January for this new person. So, okay. Um... So, Fair enough. Lauren, go ahead. I have a vague recollection that we might have done a special meeting, like done it a little, just knowing how busy the budget meetings are. Like maybe we do it a different day where um, so it doesn't get bogged down in that. Which do you mean? I feel like that's how we did it for Dan's. Like we had done like a short special meeting to look at applications and make the decision because it was so. It doesn't leave us a ton of runway there. Um, uh, Cause we could do like the 22nd, you know what I mean? Like we were gonna do it on a different night. Um, anyway, it's, it might be that we get have enough interest that it could, it could take us a while. You know what I mean? Like there we could have be one some... applicant. We <laughs> right. Like, I mean, best case scenario, we have yeah. a lot of applicants yeah. and they're good. And we have a lot to talk about. Right. You you know? One appointment that took multiple meetings. To... Yeah. Which yeah. Part? That's right. That's right. So anyway, that's, th so thank you. That's maybe we'll know. Yeah, so, but I, I also feel like, so let's just play that out a little bit. Um, let's say it was on the 21st. That means that people would have to get their signatures in by the 16th, right? right? Which means that, gosh, that is, that is exactly a month away. Mm -hmm. That's with, a, with some holidays in the middle. That is a, that's, it seems a little bit quick, <laughs> but it's like, it's on the like quick side of reasonable. <laughs> Um, I think, but, um, so, so yeah, see the other option for that, um, is the January 4th, you have a, a budget workshop scheduled for January 4th. There's nothing else on the agenda. Um, so in theory, you could have the applications due by the 21st because I don't know if it was going to apply over the holiday, Christmas holiday anyway, yeah. and then take them up right at the beginning of the, at that point both are off so that we don't have to run into that problem taking do the first order of business on the fourth would be to appoint the new member the new members mm -hmm. and then um and then go on to a budget workshop after that right and then assuming we haven't finished and at that point you would have five five members, members which you know fair enough you'd need four so right. <laughs> Um, that's true. If you do it on the twenty first, you have. Yeah. Well, depending, depending on Connor would have resigned. Oh, that's true. Right. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yep. 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 That's true. Um, right. Right. Exactly. Um, I want to go to Peter Kellerman. You've got you had your hand up for a little while. Thank you, Peter. Go ahead. 
Yeah. Um, since I was the person who asked you guys to um, announce soon, thank you for that. I I've thought about this quite a bit, and I'm just going to, I'd like to make an argument against the approach you're suggesting. And here's why. Two reasons. One is a new person coming on for less than two months, especially if you do this January idea that you just talked about, is going to have a learning curve right in the middle of budget season that I think is unreasonable. I just don't think that's going to work, particularly if you don't appoint the person until the, the beginning of the first budget workshop. Um, and uh, on the other hand, whoever does get appointed is going to have an unfair leg up by appointment on being elected in uh, in March. And also, when when do the March when do the people who are going to run for office in, in, in March have to register? I, I can't remember, but I think it's in early January, maybe. Uh, so 30. I don't buy the idea that you're going to be down, you're going to be down two. That's the mayor and Connor, right? There's no more down than that, right? So you're going to have an odd number. Odd numbers are good for voting. You guys have been together for a long time. To be clear, you know, about voting, Peter, that they actually require four votes to pass something. Yeah. Okay. Even if there's five members. No, no, I know. I, yeah, I understand. Six but I, four votes would still be required. What's that? So if there were six members, four, six people, still four votes would be required. It I, I know. It does. It, that's what I'm saying. I don't think you're gaining anything by doing this, and you're going to open yourself up for anger that you've handpicked basically the person who is going to get elected because of their incumbency and that my i remind you that happened before with jack there were some people in town who were really angry that jack got appointed and then that gave him a leg up and you know he, he you know he had incumbency Jack, but, that's not a criticism. Of you. Well, I don't want to be argumentative, but no, I, but it's an important point of information. Jack got appointed in uh, March, right after the election for a full year, April. But it was for a full year's term. It wasn't for just a month or two. I, I, I know, I understand that, but I, I'm just saying we wouldn't go short for a year. What we wouldn't run short for a year. But we, I think the question is, do you run short for a month or two? That's the, what you're no, posting. No, 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 I know. I, I'm, I'm, no, I understand that you, you absolutely needed to do it for Jack because that would have been a whole year. I'm just saying that the perception on the part of the electorate is that you guys would be handpicking by appointment somebody who then two months later, like with Dan, two months later would run and win. And I, I just want you guys to think about it. Is it re do you really gain that much by filling that seat now? I, I just don't see it. You, the number of votes you're going to need to pass something is exactly the same. You're talking about ex an experienced group of five people. Oh, sorry. Yeah, five people instead of having five experienced people and one utter novice that you guys are going to have to be explaining everything to. I, just my opinion. I'm I'm going to back off. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, John, you have a comment? Yeah, I don't usually get in, involved in discussions like this, but just as the arbiter of elections, I think it's important to remember that it's, it's easy to slide into this talking about it as some sort of administrative issue. We are talking about the election of a of a representative body, which means the represent the full representation of every citizen equally has to be the full stop final consideration and the rest is details. And that means leaving, you know, spots in some districts unfilled changes that level of representation for folks in that district. And I just, from my perspective, I think that should be an absolute non-starter. So you would advocate that we do it immediately I, as as soon as possible because that's mm -hmm. that's why this body exists that's how why the whole system exists and to to 
to, to, to go against that just because of administrative convenience or a, a concern about perception of how it's done. Okay, you know, I recognize all those things are important, but at the end of the day, what's really important is that everybody in town is equally represented in certainly the budget, which is probably the biggest thing you all do. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think we should, uh, well, okay, let me back up. What I'm hearing um, is that uh, we should probably have a motion to direct the city clerk to hold an election for the no, ma mayor. Well, oh, right, sorry. <laughs> Just kidding, not that one. Um, in anticipation of a vacancy for Connor, um, we probably need a motion about posting or a asking for applications or posting that position. Have them do December 16 for consideration on December 21st. You can always carry it forward if you don't, you know, if you want to get more applications. I mean, you can do what you need to do, but that that seems to be that is a month. Okay. Even even with a holiday. And I the oh yeah. Okay. So, um the only other question so I, I personally i fully support the um the notion that you've got to get signatures i'll just point out that um i think the last time we did this when council member morton was because of the pandemic we did not require signatures and i could be wrong about that but no i, think... I got signatures okay good <laughs> excellent well, i will be quiet you get signatures okay Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, is there, so it, it would be useful if we made that motion yep. today to give yes. folks as much time as possible to prepare the word out. Um, and, yeah. And it would be for District 2, not Jen. So, yeah. That's another. Okay. Uh, is there a motion, Jack? I will make that motion. And just to be clear on what what the motion is. The motion is that we intend to appoint uh, <clears throat> a replacement, a temporary replacement on uh, on December 21st, that uh, petitions with uh, bearing the signatures equal to the number of signatures to put a council candidate on the ballot will, will be due by December 16th. For the district two council. for the district two vacancy and uh, the anticipated vacancy, and the clerk. Yeah, I don't know that the clerk needs to do anything between now and then, except to we accept we do whatever. the we do the the manager's office usually does the publicity around it, and the clerk accepts the petitions and certifies the signatures. Yep. Just just like any other signatures, the yep. clerk gets for him. Yep. Okay. Yes, Lauren. Is, is in the motion, it's signatures and there's an application. Also, yes, or is it just getting signatures we and names? We've done that in the past, right? We had an app, had them fill out the application form for like the general committee like committees mm -hmm. thing to get background. I think it's helpful. I think it, it's probably helpful. It's fine. Yeah. We can put that in the okay. motion too. Okay. I don't recall if I had to do that or not. But, uh, I, I don't know if it existed, but it's fine. Um. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion about this? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> and opposed. Okay. So the motion passes unanimously. So we do not need to do roll call. Um, thank you, everybody, for having this discussion and helping us get some clarity around it. I think um, that will be. Uh, good to get the word out. Um, we'll try not to change our minds in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so at, you can resign from newly elected positions and stay here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Another option. Um, so uh, I didn't check with you ahead of time to see if we think that there's going to be any votes coming out of these executive sessions. Um, but just in case, maybe we should do council reports now. Right. Um, and I mean, it's, it, it is 839. Do we, I, I feel like we should do our council reports, 
then take a take a break and then go into executive session. Does that sound reasonable? Yep. Okay. Uh, Donna is not here. Okay. Um, Carrie, go ahead. I do not have anything for a report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Connor. I'll pass as well. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. I'll pass. Great. Thank you. Jack. I'm also passing tonight. Uh, Lauren. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I guess, so this is the first meeting that I have had since the November 8th election. And so I just want to thank everybody, uh, first of all, who voted. Thank you to everyone who, um, who supported me and uh, I am really looking forward to uh, representing the Washington District uh, in in the, in the Senate. Uh, it's going to be great, and yeah, and also it's going to be really hard to leave this group. Um, but more on that later. Um, uh, John, I really feel like there was something I needed to report to you guys, but I don't remember what it was. So I guess I passed too. <laughs> okay, Bill. Um, I just have a couple of things. Uh, one is somewhat substantive. Um, at, it, as we go forward in the next meeting, we'll be presenting the budget at the next meeting. We did have our budget Congress today with staff. Um, shockingly, it was done by noon. Uh, it was scheduled all day to, for today and all day for tomorrow. Um, so I think, you know, it's go big or go home, I guess, was kind of it. So we'll, we'll be putting the fine to tune on that, but we do, we will be suggesting, and I want to be clear about this so everyone has time to think about it. I think is you will it won't it'll actually affect this budget, but I will be recommending that we consider putting on the ballot a charter change to implement the local sales tax. Um, it now, you know, we would be getting the revenue from uh, sales of of cannabis, which is a new uh, probably high sale, and also uh, a couple of years ago they changed so Amazon. Revenues are now available. So what was I got? I've got to fine tune these numbers so we won't take over the bank. But what was I think eight or nine hundred thousand dollars in potential revenue is now closer to one and a half million dollars a year for us. So I want to I want to vet that and make sure I'm not exaggerating. But it's real money, and it certainly seems like given budget and inflation um, pressures on our budget uh, to to be able to bring another revenue stream in is worth a policy discussion and. Perhaps about that's your, going to be your choice, but I want to give everyone clear that it's going to be part of the budget recommendation that we do that. Um, th so uh, there's that. Then I think there's a couple of other ballot items just to be thinking about uh, as we go forward. Um, we talked at the last meeting about whether to continue with CVPSA. They'll be attending our meeting on the 14th to talk about their budget request. But again, I just think that's something we want to consider. Do we want to put that on the ballot? Don't have to decide now. Potential ballot item, we're still checking this out about the stormwater utility, whether we want to enact stormwater utility and whether that is a charter change uh, or not. Um, so that's a possibility. And then we just added tonight a potential bond reauthorization. Um, and actually, it's not out of the, well, we'll talk about that later, but it could actually have two of those. Oh. Uh, well, to, so that I'm, I won't try to be obtuse. Uh, this is uh, more for later, but getting food for thought. We are preliminary numbers for the Confluence Park are now up to two million dollars. Uh, and you know, I think originally we thought this was going to be a five hundred thousand dollar project. Grew to one point one or one point two million dollars. The city at last year's vote put six hundred. Well, we approved a bond for one point eight million, including six hundred thousand for the Confluence Park. Now it's not as specifically worded as the pellet stove was. So it's it's a little vaguer. Um, so it could be we just do the other items and never issue that bond and it just we have that extra bonding, bonding capacity or uh, potentially go to the voters and ask to reallocate that to say Country Club Road or you know, some other place that we use. The funding, I don't think it would really be appropriate for paving or something like that, but um, you know, considering that we may be it's possible we won't be putting as much into the capital plan as we had hoped. Spoiler alert. <laughs> um, it's possible that finding another place to do some capital park. So something to think about. And then I, and on obviously the question, just if we need a wording change from pellet stove to other uh, net zero type activities. So those are some possible ballot items to keep your minds thinking of as we go into the next 
um, meetings. And, and um, just to be also clear, we have a budget workshop scheduled for December, for January 4, but the 14th and 21st are supposed to be working budget meetings. So you two don't get out of them. Um, <laughs> so the 4th is there if we still need another another workshop. And then of course the the next, there's two meetings that are the actual required public hearings. And then we have a potential workshop in between. So all kidding aside, if we finish by the 21st, the new person will just have to go through the public hearings and not necessarily the decision process. <laughs> so bring your pillows. We'll stay late those two nights, get them done. Um, and then just the last notice, the speaking of budget, I, the mayor just sent out her budget survey to you all and we, issued our informal survey that we've done the last couple of years out to um, the public. See, I think we've already got a couple hundred responses back. We haven't looked, we don't know what they are, but we, they're back. Uh, and again, those are just to give us a sense of what people think. They're not binding, obviously, but it's just uh, some public feedback as to what's on people's minds. Um, so that's all I have other than, um, so the, yeah, I do have one other, well, you're gonna take a break, right? Before you go, I just yes. there's a correction on which sat statutory site we're going to executive session. Oh, when we get to that, I will. Okay, we'll talk about it then. Okay, uh, so with that, we are gonna take a ten minute break. So we'll be back here at eight fifty six to. I, I anticipate going to executive session. So, um, we'll see you then. Great. Okay, so we're coming back from our break. Um, just as a matter of uh, logistics, because the reasons to go into executive session are different, I kind of wonder if we have to come out of executive session for the one to then go into the other. Technically, yes, but I think you could just say you I think you could say we're no take your executive session into this to, to do this, that's this. followed by going to the yeah. to do this. Okay. 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 Um and did you want to change yeah, so for the property discussion, it should the proper site is one VSE three thirteen A two. And then the proper site for, because um, oh, I don't have the other one in front of me, the proper site for the personnel one is 1 VSA 313A3. So that one's right. Okay. No. Yeah, it, that's a, it's a public records. Huh. So I, it's, it's a ex public records exemption. I'm sure okay. Mary just picked it up instead of the meeting so all right well so we have a, a long executive session motion to be made and I, these, neither of these require the the other finding right mm -hmm. Just to be clear go ahead jack for simplicity i'll make two separate motions okay one i moved that uh, <clears throat> we go into executive session pursuant to one bsa section 313 a2 for the purpose of uh, discussing a potential uh, real estate uh, purchase. Further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, do you want to do the other one right now? Yes, okay. I, I move that upon the conclusion of our previously ordered executive session, we enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3 to discuss uh, uh, personnel matter, the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. Okay, further discussion. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so and did we determine whether or not we anticipate having a motion? Coming out of it. Will not need a motion coming out. Alec needs the executive session link. He just texted me right before. Okay, so we will only be coming out of executive session to adjourn then. Okay. Uh, okay, well, thank you everybody who joined us. Uh,
either in person or virtually. This oh, so we need to we need to stay in right. our, stay in here in our law, but but those of us we, well, all, we have to log in to log out session. of this and log into the next right. one. Yeah, exactly. So come back here, and, and then you're all good as long <clears> as we can still have the sound and everything from the folks on a different link. Right. Cool. Thank you. What's that? Yes. Yeah.